So well, we're going to jump into the message today, and I am so excited. We've been on a series now for a few weeks called A New Normal. We've been going through chapter by chapter through the book of Ephesians, and we've spent the last two weeks on chapter one and chapter two. If you've missed it, make sure you go back and listen and watch on YouTube. Chapter one and chapter two, they're really very important foundational introductory messages to the book of Ephesians. And now we're going to get into chapter three, which is a few of my most favorite verses in all of the New Testament, which obviously the well-known one, Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do above and beyond. We're going to get there today. So I'm so excited to jump into chapter Three. Here we go. Let's read together. I know you're in your PJs. You're at home. You're making breakfast. Maybe you're on a run. You're at work. I know some people last weekend texted me. They're on a kayak in the river watching service. That is no word of a lie. Like mention a kayak. So there you go. I mentioned your kayak. If you're out in the river right now, I mentioned it for you. Um, but we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 3. Grab your Bible. Grab your notepad. You're going to take some notes and think with me today. I'm really believing that that what we're going to talk about today is going to give you some life and some air in your lungs today. So here we go. We're going to jump down into verse 7. We're going to skip the, few couple, uh, the first six verses only in that it, it starts where we left off last week about the new temple. We're all together, this mysterious plan. It kind of just continues in the chapter 3. So we're not going to address verses 1 through 6 today. We're going to jump into chapter 3 and verse 7. That's where we're going to start today. So why don't you find Ephesians, and let's pray as we jump into the book of Ephesians today. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray you'd speak to us. Would you illuminate who you are today through this chapter, through these 14 verses that we're going to read today. God, I thank you for who you are, that you're speaking to us through your word together. No matter who we are, where we are, where we're watching this message from, God, would you speak to us, God, in our life, in our marriage, in our world, whatever is going on, speak to us today, Jesus, through your word. In your mighty, mighty name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, we've talked about in chapter one that, you know, we're not trying to escape. We're trying to invade. We've talked about we are in Christ, that we are forgiven, we are chosen, we're adopted, that we are, everything we have is in Christ. And then last week in chapter two, we talked about that we are trophies of grace, not of effort, and God is doing this, and it's his work. And now we're a temple, and there's no more us and them. Now there's only us. He's made one family and one nation and one name, and that's all of chapter two. Then chapter three is the end of uh, a section. We talked about the very first week that chapters one, two, and three are kind of one um, one part of the letter and, uh, letter, and then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are another part. So here in chapter 3, Paul is ending all of his thoughts. It's kind of like he's, he's wrapping up. He's putting a bow on the present. He's, he's finishing all of his thoughts in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So chapter 3 is what I want to call today a pastor's prayer. Chapter 3 is, he, you notice it's, it's Paul's prayer. And he says it multiple times, I pray. I pray, I'm praying for you, I pray this, I pray that. So today I want to title this special talk, A Pastor's Prayer. And truly I I find it very fascinating that Paul addresses uh, a lot of prayers because these four things we're going to go through today, this is my prayer for us. As your pastor, as your shepherd, if you go to our church here at Rose, this is my pastor's prayer for our community and for our family. So we're going to dive in, here we go, chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, by God's grace... In mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Verse 8, though I am least deserving of all of God's people, he graciously gave me, here it is again, the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan of God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the very beginning. Number one, his first prayer is that you'd be happy to just be in the room. To just be happy to be in the room. I love uh, chapter three and verse seven and eight. He goes, I consider it a privilege and an honor to be chosen to communicate this mysterious plan. I remember the first time I took Cruz and Quinn, my wife and I, to Disneyland. We're all, we were staying at Disney Hotel, the matter rail, the, uh, the monorail comes right there. We get in, we're the only one in the, us and Southern family in the car. Cruz, for the first time, is seeing all of the, you know, the statues and the figures, and he is beside himself. He's like three and a half at this point, and he is, dad, look, dad, look, dad, look. And I'm like, yeah, buddy, I see it. He's like, no, he's like turning my face. Like, yes, I, I see it, buddy. And he's freaking out, right? And then there's another family with two boys, and they're about 10 and 12. And they're like, I've seen it before. We've been here 100 times. 
We have a year-long pass. We came last weekend. Yeah, you know, they completely are downgrading everything that Cruz is so happy about because it's his first time seeing it. They've been here an umpteen amount of times because they have a year-long pass. And notice, I, I, I was thinking this sitting in that car, how often does familiarity breed contempt? That the more that we come and the more that we see and the more that we hear, it's not, oh, oh it's Disney. It's like, yeah, it's Mickey again, and it's food again, and it's the ride again, and it's Splash Mountain again. And we, we begin to lose our wonder. I want to challenge you when it comes to serving God, never lose your wonder. Let it be like your first time every time. And I think Paul's pastoral prayer and the first one is like, I'm just happy to be in the room. I'm just happy to serve. I'm just happy to commit my life to the gospel and share this mysterious plan. He says it twice. This is a privilege. And he goes, I'm the least of all people. Whoa, wait a minute. That sounds like really like humble until you realize who Paul is. When you do the history of who Paul is, Paul's a big deal. He is a, he is a Pharisee. He knows the word. He knows the law. He was raised by a man named Galileo. I mean, he is the man, yet he still understands I'm nothing. Of any person in the Gospels that could say, I have it, it would be Paul. Of any person that could brag, it would be Paul. Of any person that could say, I, I understand why God chose me. I have a lot to say. I'm very intelligent. I have degrees. I know the word inside and out. I'm zealous, he says in other chapters, for the word of the Lord. I mean, Paul could be like, yeah, I understand why God chose me. Because I'm the least of all people. I'm the least of who God uh, should have chosen. And it is an honor and it is a privilege. I want to challenge you today. If you are serving in God's house, especially here at Rose, let us remind ourselves it is my honor. It is my privilege. That I'm so thankful that he chose me to serve in his house. I love, look at Psalms 84. It'll be right there on the screen. Psalms 84 and verse 10. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. David's reminding himself, I would rather be a gatekeeper than to be a president in somebody else's house. In other words, I would rather serve coffee in the Lord's house than be a man somewhere else. I'd rather hold a sign and say, welcome to church. I'd rather check kids in. I would rather pour coffee for someone. I would rather design something for the church. I, I would rather be nothing if I could just be in the house, if I could be near the gates, if I could be near his presence. I would rather rather do nothing near his presence than be everything away from his presence. David is reminding us, I'm just I'm thankful to be in the house. I'm thankful to serve the Lord. And Paul's saying this, his first prayer, I'm just, it's my honor. It's my privilege. I want to challenge you. If you are serving at this community, remind yourself, you are helping me preach the gospel. Now, I know we don't have church right now as normal when it comes to serving and teams and the golf carts and all that stuff, but I'm going to continue to remind me, to remind you that when you are serving the house, when you are serving people, we are preaching the gospel. There's a stat recently that people decide in the first seven minutes if they're coming back to church. Seven minutes. So that means they've already decided if they're coming back before the gospel's ever preached. You know what that tells me? is the golf cart drivers are preaching the gospel. The welcoming team are preaching the gospel. The people waving and smiling are preaching the gospel. The cafe team is preaching the gospel. The gospel being preached is a team effort. Though I have the mic, we have the authority. And we are doing this together. I want to challenge you today. Remind yourself, man, I'm just thankful to be in the room. I'm just thankful to do anything in God's house. It is an honor and it's a privilege. I'm the least of people. You know what's interesting? When you get in maybe a church world to speak in this space, all the men that you could sit at a table with, and they have all the right to be the big guy, they're always the ones asking all the questions. Why is it the ones that we consider a big deal, they don't consider themselves to be a big deal? And that's why they're a big deal. I love sitting with people that should be answering all the questions. Oh, no, but in turn, they're asking questions about you. And they're asking, how did you do that? What did that mean for you? Why? Because they've understood, I'm just honored to be a part. Yeah. It's an honor and a privilege to be a part. Second thing I want to draw out today from Ephesians chapter 3, and this is where it gets so good. It Let's jump down to verse 10. God's purpose in all this was to use the church. 
Understand this today. The church is not God's plan B. It wasn't an accident. It's not like if something else doesn't work, I guess I'll use the church. The church is God's plan A. It is his mission. It is his vehicle. God doesn't have a vision. God has a church, which is his vision. And he says right there, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom. And it's rich variety to all the unseen rulers. Notice back to chapter one. He's bringing in spirituality again. He's bringing back the, the idea that there's this unseen world and all the spiritual minded people in Ephesus. He draws it back again in chapter three to display his wisdom to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was, hear this, the eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ, our faith in him, we now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. Paul's in prison while writing this letter. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. Now look at this transitional phrase. When I think of all this, all this is what? The eternal plan of God using the church to to defeat unseen rulers and authorities. He goes, when I think of all of this, what is this? What we just read. I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of, everyth- creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray from his glorious, unlimited resource that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. The second thing I want you to understand today is this, that the Holy Spirit would be your inner strength. Think about it. When I think of all this, I pray from God's glorious and unlimited riches that he would give you strength. Not just strength, physical strength. He goes, I pray you get inner strength through his spirit. I'll give you two thoughts today about the inner strength. Number one, you must understand where that strength comes from. It is not you trying harder. It is not you trying to be strong and trying to be better. He goes, no, the Holy Spirit will come into your inner being and give you inner strength. The first thing you better understand is where your strength is coming from. It's not coming from those sorcerers. It's not coming from goddess Diana. It's not coming from the temple of Artemis. It's not coming from the person you could pray or pay for them to pray for you. It's not coming from, once again, think about all the spiritual things. No, that is not giving you strength. The greatest strength that you could receive is the inner strength of the Holy Spirit. But notice, it is strength coming from without to within. When I submit this to you, the strength you're looking for will not come from within to without. It will come from without to within. You don't possess the inner strength. It has to come to you and in you. And it's his spirit that gives you inner strength. Now, this is phenomenal. I was talking to my, my college professor this last week for an hour on the phone about that one word. Why do we need strength is my question. What is the inner strength for? And he goes, here, and he told you. I was like, yeah, well, how about you tell me? Because I'm a little confused. So why don't you tell me what he meant? He was like, remember the transitional phrase. When I think of this, when I think of this, what is the this? The eternal plan of God using his church. Okay, I'm going to throw some out to you. You need, to, you need to consider this. Maybe the strength that you need is to remind yourself of the eternal plan more than your plan. So the actual inner strength is that the strength would remind us there is an eternal plan. He is working in the eternal realm. He is using his church. But many of us, the reason why we get caught up with God is because we get consumed with our personal plan. So I'll say it this way. If you're sick and healing doesn't come to your body, is the eternal healing still happening? So maybe you're not receiving healing right now. Maybe you're going through a sickness and healing hasn't entered your body yet. But if you remind yourself, oh, I'm not the eternal plan. I am one piece of many thousands and millions and hundreds of millions of people. I need to remind myself, though I'm not personally receiving healing, there is an eternal plan of healing going on. There is an eternal plan of blessing. What do I need strength for? To keep my mind on the eternal plan of God. It's not just the eternal plan to get through your job. It's not just the, the strength to get you through the next hour, though that is very valid and very real. The inner strength of the spirit is to have your eyes take a step back from your little small bleep on the screen and go, there's an eternal plan. And I need the inner strength to remind myself 
He's doing something eternal. He's using his church. And I'm a small part of this, though I am doing something significant. I'm not the whole plan. And there's something eternal going on. I pray today that your eyes would get off just the small bleep of your life and the small bleep of your money and the small bleep of your business and you would step back and go, Holy Spirit, give me inner strength to keep my heart reminding myself there is something eternal going on. And though I can't sense it or feel it, you are healing people. You are blessing people. You are moving in people's lives. Though I can't see it, my inner strength is reminding me something eternal is going on. And I love it. He's doing it through what? His church. Not just small C, like Rose Church. The church, capital C, that God is moving in his church. His, His plan is working. His plan is taking ground. His plan is moving. So if you are if you are kind of downcast today and your your personal plan isn't working, good news today, even though your personal plan isn't working. Our eternal plan is moving forward. And when I think of that, I receive inner strength. I'm praying for you today that you would receive inner strength of the Holy Spirit today. Number three. I hope this is helping someone. And that was a little bit of an introduction. Let's go somewhere today. Number three, my pastoral prayer is that your heart is a place that God owns, not rents. Mm. Look at chapter 3 and verse 17. Then, then, another transitional word. So once the Spirit gives you strength, you have eternal inner strength, then Christ will make his what? His home in your hearts as you trust in him. Look at this. He goes a little deeper. So your roots will grow down into God's love and it will keep you, there's another strength word, it will keep you strong. Yes, sir. Now he says, my prayer is that God would make his home in your heart. Mm-hmm. Don't we think of like a little child praying, Jesus, I ask you into my heart. And that's where that idea comes from, that God is in your heart. And I think when I, when I first read this, like, that's cute. Like the Lord's going to live in our heart. It's, it's actually not cute. It's actually very challenging. Yes. Um, Have you ever moved somewhere and someone else owned it and you moved in and it's now your home and you're like, this paint is hideous. Get rid of that carpet. I don't know what they were thinking for that bathroom. (laughs) Tear that tile off. When you make something your home, you change the previous owner's ideas. That is not cute. That does not make me feel soft and fuzzy when the Bible says he's going to make his home in your heart. We're like, yeah. He's like, you don't get what home means, do you? That means your paint that you love so much, I'm going to change it all. That bathroom that you took a year and a half to build, I'm going to tear all of that up, and I'm going to redo some new tile, some brand new grout, and you're going to, listen to me, if you want me to make your, my home in your heart, you better be prepared. When I make it at home, I'm changing everything you did previously. And that is not cute. That's actually very uncomfortable. Especially when you save money for that paint. And you, you dreamed of that bathroom. And he's like, yeah, that wasn't my dreams. I'm going to undo the whole thing. You're like, but I'm uncomfortable. He's like, yeah, I know, but your house sucks. So um, I'm, I'm going to redo the whole thing. I'm going to repaint the whole thing. You're like, but I thought you were going to move into my heart. Yeah, it's my home now. When you rent somewhere, you put up with things you don't like. You just do. When you're like renting somewhere, like, I, would, I would never do that, but I'm moving. I would never live in this shag carpet. I would tear the whole thing up, but I'm, I don't care. I'm moving soon. Does God rent your heart or does does he own your heart? What's very difficult is when you allow God to rent your heart, he moves in every Sunday and starts readjusting things. And then by the next Sunday, you did, you redid everything he did the previous Sunday. So maybe you should ask yourself, why am I not growing in God? Because every Sunday, he has to redo what he did last Sunday. And he's just playing this game with you that he readjusts. Are we good? Yes. And then he leaves for six days, and you rent your heart out to someone else, and they do some things, and then Sunday comes around, and he gets back in and goes, didn't I paint that last week? 
I thought I told you to throw that away. I thought I told you to read. What? Okay, let's start over. And before you know it, you're in this cyclical stuck pattern that every Sunday he's re-signing the lease and trying to ask, can I be home in your heart? Paul says, oh, well, once he makes his inner strength with his Holy Spirit, he's going to make his home in your heart. Jesus wants to be a resident, not a renter. Maybe today is a really good moment for you to ask yourself, does he own my heart, or do I just periodically rent him rent it for a few hours, a few days? I've never seen the show, Don't Judge Me, Get Off My Back, but you are in a daily Game of the Thrones battle. You have a throne, it's called your heart, and every single day there is a Game of Thrones that people and things are trying to sit on that throne every single day. And that's why reading and praying your word reminds your heart there is a throne and one person gets to sit on it. And if you're not careful, what Augustine wrote in his book called Confessions, if you want to get really nerdy and heady, go read Augustine's Confessions letter. He says, our heart is run by disordered loves. There are things in your heart that you can love. They're just out of order. And if you're not careful, you will subconsciously be run by disordered loves. So every day, there's a game of thrones. There's a war of thrones going on in your heart on who's going to sit on the throne of your heart. And, and Paul says, I'm so thankful that you guys are letting the Holy Spirit be your inner strength. He's going to make his home in you. Right? Yeah, right. It's, no, it's a little different than you think. He's going to fix some stuff and repaint some stuff. And this is what really got me. Seriously challenged me this next week. I was talking to my professor about this term. I want to switch it. Not only does he want to make his home in your heart, but catch this. He wants to feel at home in your heart. Now, this is what got me. When you accept people into your home, you begin to take in their considerations on what music do they like and what wine do they drink and what food do they eat. Why? Because you want them to feel what? At home. So I want to ask you today, does your current heart space, does Jesus feel at home there? Because when he starts moving in, he, he doesn't feel at home where bitterness is. He doesn't feel at home where racism is. He doesn't feel at home where impurity is. And he starts moving in. Not only does he want to make it his home, but he wants to feel at home. Psalms 23, sorry, sorry, Psalms 24, verses 3 and 4. David writes, who may climb to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? Only those with clean hands and what? Pure hearts. David says, who can ascend to the Lord? Who can stand in his presence? Who can stand before the Lord? Only those with clean hands and pure hearts. Psalms 139, verse 23 to 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Now look at this. This is challenging. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. When was the last time that you asked the Lord, is there anything that you don't feel at home with in my heart? Point it out to me if it offends you. Isn't it the opposite in America? No, I want the word to bend to me. I don't want to bend to the word. No, Jesus, this is who I am. Accept me, Jesus. Love me, Jesus. Put up with me, Jesus. You have to accept me. He goes, David goes, no, if there's anything in your home that you don't like and that offends you, point it out to me. And I don't want it to be there. Why? Because you are not only the owner of my heart, I want you to feel at home in my heart. My prayer for you, church, is that during this season, maybe it's time for some heart surgery moments that you step back and make the prayer of David, search me, know me, what can be in my heart that you don't want there? Would you search my inner being? Your heart is your soul, your core, your, it, it is who you are. It is the seat of your emotions. It's the seat of your personality. It's the seat of your decision making. And would you allow God to move in and go, we're going to paint that. We're going to throw that away. We're going to get something new in here. Why? Because this is my home now. And I want my home to feel like me. Have you ever noticed that every home you go to feels like them? If you go to Joel the Mel's home, it feels like Joel the Mel. There are smiley faces. There's loud colors. Everything is sensible. Because when you go to someone's home, it gives off that person's personality. 
Does your heart give off his personality? Does your heart give off, Jesus must live here. This must be his home. The sound of the music is like his home. The wording is like his home. The aura is like his home. Why? Because I want my heart to be somewhere that God owns, not rents. This is his pastoral prayer. He's, I'm praying that you'd be happy to be in the room. Second, I'm praying that God would live and own, not just rent. Number three, this is his third prayer. We're almost done. His third prayer is that you would know him and experience him. Yeah. Look at verse 18. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love truly is. Yeah. Verse 19. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand, then you will be made complete with all of the fullness of life. I love that term. The fullness of life and the power that comes from God. His third prayer is, I pray that you would not only know him, but you would experience him. Right now, on when you're watching this, but right now there's a documentary airing called The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And this documentary is phenomenal. You know what's interesting? I can name off a lot of stats about uh, Jordan. His six championships, his defensive player of the year, his rookie player of the year, his, his six MVP of the finals. Like I can name off his, his 32,000 points. I can name off a lot of his stats. I, but the, the, does, that know I, does that mean I know him? So you say, oh, you know, you know Jordan. Well, I know things about him, but I've never experienced him. I love that you can quote verse, verse after verse. I love it. I love that you can read the Bible. But is that just stats to you? Has the Holy Spirit taken God through your head down to your heart? Because you, know you know what God wants? Your head, your, your, your head, your heart, and your hand. So, yeah, some of you are very intellectual. You're very philosophical. I love that about you, but you are not in a mental ascent war with God. There is no, like, once I get smarter, more intellectual, read more books, take more classes, listen to more TED Talks, the more I understand, yeah, those are stats. Yeah, you can know things about God. You can quote scriptures and quote more, uh, things about morality. And, yeah, but, my, but I love Paul's prayer. I want you to experience his love. I want you to experience God in his fullness. Rose Church, my pastoral prayer for you is, yes, that you would know him, but more than that, you would know him in the core of your being and the core of your heart, that, yes, we know him, but more than that, we are experiencing him. Experience God's love. I know this mess with people. This is not emotionalism. I'm not just talking about the goosebumps that you get during a song or someone hits a note. or you, that, I'm not, That's not what I'm talking about. There's something deeper that when you read the word and it's like there's no one else but you and something is going on and turning and you're like, why is Paul in my mail? What, who is, what is this? This is exactly what I'm thinking. How did they know? Why? Because when you read this book, Every single time you read the book, the author is reading every line and the author is reading every chapter because without the author, this is another book. But when you read it with the author who is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, he begins to what? Experience yes. begins to happen. Yes. My prayer is not only that you would know him, but you would experience him. Fourth. Fourth prayer, and this is where it all comes to a massive crescendo. Actually, it's how it's written um, when you read commentaries and stuff. It's actually written like a poem. This whole prayer is like a poem, and it ends as if like a conductor has been going through the whole time. And this is the last sentence or the last bar in the poem, and everybody stands and cheers. This is what Ephesians 3.20, a lot of our favorite verses that we all quote and say, here we go. Let's get into Ephesians 3. I'm going to come to an end. Here we go. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able. I love the King James Version says, the New King James Version, who now is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. That's three very descriptive words, exceedingly. That does it enough. Nope, abundantly. Okay, you're pretty clear. Above, I got it now. 
above all you could ask or think or imagine. Verse 21, glory to him in the what? The church. Glory to him, not just in people's lives, in the church. Glory to him. In the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is actually a doxology. It's a benediction. It's like, amen. In other words, Ephesians 3.20 is what happens when you understand Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It's actually his ending sentence like, now that you know you're in Christ, amen. Now that you know you're forgiven, amen. Now that you know we are one family, amen. Now that you know you are seated in heavenly realms, amen. Now that you know that you are called to be in him, amen. He's, it's his ending like, amen. If you understand what I just said, Amen. My, one, one author says, if you want Ephesians 3.20, you must grasp Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It's like, do you get it now? Glory to him. The fourth thing I want you to understand today, in our, we're going to end here in Ephesians 3, is that my prayer is that his ability would change your reality. My prayer for you is that his ability would change your reality. I love Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able. I love he just starts there. By the way, before I even say what he's going to do, he's able to do it. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. All. Do you know, like, in the Greek, all means all. It means, like, everything, all, all of it. Like, all that you could ask, think, or imagine. You know this amazing word in the Greek and for the word imagine is everything you could possibly conceive and beyond. Do you know the word exceedingly means above and beyond? Do you know abundantly means above and beyond in the Greek? They're actually like the same exact word. What he's saying is God can go beyond you and then beyond, beyond. Yeah. It's multiplied beyond. It's not even like, yeah, God goes beyond and God goes. No, it's, it's, exceed, it's beyond wow. everything you think. And by the way, it's beyond, beyond. It's multiplied beyond everything you could ask or think or possibly conceive. Why? Because he's able. And I want to challenge you. Let Ephesians 3.20 dictate your prayers. Let Ephesians 3.20 dictate your writings. Let Ephesians uh, uh, Ephesians 3.20 dictate how you think, how you write, how you design, how you do business. Why? Because I'm serving in Ephesians 3.20 God, who is exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ask or think. And then this is where he ends. He ends with worship. Glory to him in the church. Do you know what Ephesians 1, 2, 3 should end with? Glory to God. Do you know what Paul's saying? I pray that every time you think about your forgiveness, you you begin to worship the glory of God. Every time you think about your adoption, you think about the glory of God. Everything, what is Paul saying? Now that we're in a transition into the rest of this book about your marriage, about unity, about people, about, about all these things that we're going to get into, goes, time out, amen. That's why it ends with amen. It's like, you should think about this. It's like a sea law. It's like, pause and think. Because every time that you think about chapters one, two, and three, it should end in worship. Every time that you think about your life, it should end with glory to God. Yeah. I said it this last week. It should not end with, I've worked really hard. Right. I've done a lot this year. I've really, man, I've really developed. I'm getting pretty good at this. Like, man, every, when you step back and you, as Paul says, when I think of these things, when you set time in your life to step back and think, it should always end with glory to God in the church. Amen. I, when I think about the goodness of God, it, I fall to my knees. When I think about my business, it's reminding me of his glory. When I think about my kids, I think of his glory. When I think of my finances, I think of his glory. What is Paul saying? My prayer is when you think of God, let it lead to worship and glory. Amen. He ends this benediction with yeah, everything we talked about. Glory to God. That should be our response when we think about everything else we've talked about. Glory to God. Why? Because his ability should start changing my reality. You see, understand this today, that God is trying to change you into him as it, his image. So let us stop trying to create him in ours. How often are we trying to bring God down? Like, well, you can do this, and you can do that, and th- I think, God, you can do this, and I think if I could just get this for a little bit, and what do we start doing? We're at God 
act like me, think like me. Right. No, we're supposed to be being created in his image, right. not him being created in right. our image. And right. his image is exceedingly, right. abundantly right. above. Right. That's who our God is. And it should end with worship and glory. And goes, amen. I don't know what else to say, so I'll amen myself. I love that Paul just amens himself. Like, amen. That's really good. Like, amen. It's, it's another word for see lots. You should pause and think. Before, most, uh, we won't get into this today, but Ephesians 4, 1 is therefore. It's a transition. Like, everything I talked about, therefore I. 1, 2, and 3 is about theology. 4, 5, and 6 is about practical. We're about to get into really practical. Amen. Now that I've talked about who you are and what you have and who we are together and the temple and everything, it should lead and end with worship. This is my pastoral prayer for our church. My prayer for you is, number one, that you just be happy to be in the room. Number two, that God would own, not rent your heart. Number three, that you would experience him. And number four, his ability would change your reality. That is a pastoral prayer. That is my desire for our church called Rose, that this pastoral prayer that Paul wrote is also challenging our church and our people that we're going to live. Why? Because this is our new normal. Exceedingly abundantly above is our new normal now. To live in him is our new normal. To be forgiven is our new normal. To God own our heart is our new normal. To be happy, all these things, this is our new normal. Let's pray together as we end our time in Ephesians chapter three. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are challenging us and stretching us and moving into our hearts today. God, if some things need to change and some paintings need to change and some carpet needs to change, and God, we need to think bigger, exceedingly abundantly above God, if we need to think differently about you, God, I pray that you would challenge every home, every business owner, every nurse and doctor, every freelancer, God, every designer, every, every architect, God, every, every business owner, whoever we are, whatever sector of life we are running in, would you challenge our heart today? Would you expand our being? Would you expand our mind and our mindset, God, and our heart set? Would you move in and begin to change us from the end? side out, God. We want inner strength today. If, we're, if we are so consumed with our personal story, God, would you put us uh, some strength in us to remind ourselves there is an eternal plan going on. It's not just about me. It's not just about my world and my money, God. Would you, would you fix our eyes on the eternal plan that you're doing, God? I thank you for your mighty, mighty name I pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Have an awesome day, church.